Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event. Are you ready? Let's get ready to ramp up your sales. And now the man you've been waiting for, he is the real thriller in Manila. The undisputed, undefeated, reigning, defending, pound for pound, heavyweight, John, the sales machine, Rankin! Ladies and gentlemen, today's guest brings over 20 years of go-to-market and sales revenue roles to the table. His approach to teaching founders and sales reps how to earn the right to ask questions, which questions to ask and when, is his primary forte. His client list includes Fortune 500 brands as well as startups, including Zoom, Salesforce, Human Interest, Dusty Robotics, Gainsight, and many, many more. He's also the founder of Harris Consulting Group, co-founder of Surf and Sales, and the host of the Surf and Sales podcast. His book, The Seller's Journey, is available on Amazon, and you've got to go out and get it. He's got insight from legendary experience. Let's welcome him to the podcast, ladies and gentlemen, Richard Harris. Dude, that is the best intro. I'm, I'm like, I'm in chills. Like, that is so nice of you. Thank you. Um, I have done all those things, but uh, wow, you you definitely bring it to the table in a different way. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play that for my wife and kids so they know how wonderful I am. Hey, man, it's all the blood, sweat, and tears and fears that you overcame to, to do those things that gives the intro justice. And, you know, I'm all about selling without selling and propelling people empowering them right i've literally built sales teams for 30 years and and you know people feel good about people that see the good in them and what they've done so you know we do that in morning meetings i've been doing that for 30 years propping up the people that are setting the pace contributing training building others and that's what you do so i want to get right into yes what you do and how you do it i mean you've worked with some of the biggest companies in the world. Tell me about your experience working with like Zoom, Salesforce, and what did they see in you to say, hey man, go get Richard because we need Richard. Yeah, it's 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 a really good question. Uh because I always ask that. I always ask like why me? You know, what 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 was it? And I'll ask them when they first meet me, you know, like uh, General GE, General Electric, like they found me on a Google search and I'm what, lowly me? Like you found me on a Google search? Okay, I'm like, hats off to my marketing team for like doing their job, right? Um, the What people tell me, the people that are the happiest always tell me that it's the one, how I listen and ask thought provoking questions of them to understand their world. And then the other piece is really making sure it's customized to them. You know, there's not a whole lot that's changed in sales since Mesopotamia, right? You got a product, you got a service, you got a goods, and you're, you're you know, we're, you know, whatever you're trading, you're trading, right? It happens to be cash these days, maybe Bitcoin. Uh, but it matters how you say it and how it relates for your organization and in relation to your own organization's customers and prospects. And then also the human aspect, right? Like how John says something's different than Richard, right? So what people have told me is that they like the authenticity and the customization of it so that it's not scripted. I don't have a problem with sales scripts and those things. What I don't want is for people to sound scripted. I want John to sound like John and Richard to sound like Richard. So those are the things people tell me that they like about it. Um, the other piece that they tell me too is that it's, it's not just a training, it's a reinforcement program because there's you know, it's not just, hey, show up, throw up and, and train and you're done. It's like there's additional stuff. So I've heard that a lot of what's going around right now, Richard, more than ever is people are talking about commission breath. Yeah. Ooh, I haven't heard. Yeah. Commission breath for sure. That's a good one. I understand why there's scripts. Yeah. And people develop scripts because they're really not educating people on the fundamentals of sales. And like you said, Sales really hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. 
However, a lot of people have gotten into sales that have no idea about service. Yes. They're looking to make a commission. And so Zig Ziglar said it better than anything. Sales are about three things and it hasn't changed over time at all. Zero. I've done it since I was an 11 year old paper boy, right? Sales is service, solving problems and making sure people are happy and satisfied with what you did, right? So you can sell them more and help them more. Along the way, right. it's been my experience, the psychology of a lot of people or companies doing sales is just make the sale, do whatever you gotta do to make the sale instead of coming from service. Because when you come from service, you're never nervous. Doesn't matter if you're in a boardroom, if you're speaking uh, from the stage one on many, if you're one on one, like if you really listen, people will tell you what they need. And then sales is something you do for them, not to them. And that's, and what's changed along the way is there's a lot of different psychology and methodology out there, right? So for me, as long as I allow my salespeople to understand that psychology, and then we give them a methodology, the psychology is SSS. That's the psychology, come from service, solve problems, and make sure people are satisfied. That's the, that's the psychology you need to have. A lot of people say, oh, I'm not a salesman. Do you like to help people? Because I absolutely am in love with helping people. 100%. 100%. Yes. Like you said earlier, sales hasn't changed. It's, it's just, I think it's our understanding. And I'm a big fan of the psychology piece too, right? Like understanding what motivates a human, not only for yourself, but then being able to put yourself to the side to understand what motivates John is also really important. And then, you know, our job as salespeople is to connect those things, right? And there's nothing wrong with being altruistic and profitable. Like sometimes people think you can't do both and you can, right? You do the altruism part first, right? That's what matters because the profit will come back even when you lose a deal, you know, as well as I do. Two years later, they come back and say, I remember this, I wanna to talk to you, or now I'm at a new place, or hey, I can't help you, but so-and-so said we should talk, or like, you know, you lead with that, you lead with your heart, you lead with the altruism, the rest can take care of itself and can be learned, right? You can learn how to sell. Now, whether someone has the willingness to do it or the desire and want, that's a different thing, but, it's, you know, it can be taught and learned. Let's talk about your journey because I mean, let's face it, you wrote the seller's journey, but ultimately what's the first thing that you ever sold? We, and we talked about it earlier. Yeah. We talked about it earlier. The very first thing I ever remember selling, um, was Jolly Ranchers. My next door neighbor's brother was selling them at, for like a fundraiser at high school. So I went and bought them from him. And then I turned around and sold them down at, at, you know, grammar school and middle school. And, uh, you know, this is, this is in the, yeah, I guess it's in the seventies or early eighties, you know, that's a no, no, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to sell candy at school. Um, although today everybody's got a binging machine, but yeah, that was the first thing I, I sold, um, that, that, that was pretty good. So the second thing I sold was convincing my mom that it was more important for me to get a, a walk man then go on a ski trip to Utah when I'd never been skiing, you know, keep in mind, I grew up in Georgia of all places. So I didn't know what skiing was like. Um, so those, those are my first two big recollections of sales, you know, at an early, early age. Right on. And what was your first professional sales job and, and, and the biggest thing that you learned there? Yeah. So my first real sales job was actually at the gap, like in high school. Um, and I have an uncle who lives out here in San Francisco and he used to work for Levi's back in the day. And, you know, when I, I always knew I liked sales. My mom was in sales. She still is. My dad was in sales. So I was sort of surrounded by it. And my uncle is in sales. And, you know, I went and got that high school job and he's like, you know, that's a really smart job because, you know, pretty much for the rest of your life, everybody's going to know the gap. Like it was a good logo to have as a first job. 
What's interesting is that was my job in high school. I loved it, had a good time. I didn't work at all during college. I was very privileged and obnoxious. And then my last semester of college, I decided to go get a job. So of course I wanted to go work at the Gap. I was like jeans and t-shirts. I, I want to graduate. I don't want to wear a coat and tie. I've never been a coat and tie guy. And uh, I got fired. Like I was not, I, I was so um, expectant of it, right? Like I, you know, what, you know, I was so entitled to think that they were going to hire me and make me, you know, the, the, you know, the manager and, and I got fired and I went back and I begged, I begged for them to bring me back. And I said, but this is what I want to do. I want to be a manager when I'm, I'm graduating in four months, you know, the whole thing. And my store manager just said, you know, you know, I don't know. And she's like, I'll put you on probation. And so she put me on probation. She had me on call and I earned my way back in, right? I did. And then from that, I became a store manager at another store that opened right after I graduated college. And that was like my first real, not only was it a sales job, but it was also management. So now I was like interviewing people at the age of 23 who had no clue how to interview anybody. So that that's the beginning of my journey of, of sales. So I'll, I'll stop there because I'm like you, I could go on forever. <laughs> how did you get into doing B2B sales and then evolve into training B2B? A couple things. So one, um, college roommate of mine, his dad owned these cool weekly newspapers around the country. There's one in Denver and there's, you know, the most popular one's probably the Village Voice in New York City. Um, but they were, they have, there's papers like this all over the country. And so I went and sold classified ads in the back of this newspaper that came out every week. That was my first foray into like a real B2B world. And we're literally cold calling and, you know, we're calling real estate agents to put their houses for rent. We're calling handyman to put their things in where anything that goes in a classified section, right? And so that was the first B2B and it was a cool company because it was, this is, this is pre-internet. This is mid nineties late nineties. And, um, you know, this paper would come out on a Wednesday and this is what everybody looked at who was 20, whatever, to go see what band's playing, what's, what bar's going on, where you're going for the weekend, what you're going to do. So it was super cool and hip and fun. And I loved it. Um, and they, they kept us, you know, really young and we ran the place. And at the age of 27, they sent me to Cleveland, Ohio from Denver, Colorado to go run a classified department. They're like, here's the keys, go do it, go figure it out. You know, so, um, so that's where I really, really cut my teeth on, on B2B and figuring it out and hiring and interviewing and training. And I always realized that I was never the best salesperson, right? Like, like if you think about baseball, right, there's like 10 players, there's nine players in the lineup, right? And I was always like a number seven or eight hitter, right? I didn't need to be the top. I didn't need to, I wasn't the fastest guy to steal bases, but I could, you know, I could do things, but I was always a good middle person to be there and could be a starter. And that's sort of how I was in sales, but I really loved the piece of teaching someone else how to sell. I love that piece around watching someone else become fulfilled and achieve things. And I certainly know that my I've done enough psychology in my life too, and enough therapy to, to know that some of that was feeding my own ego, which is a whole other story, but that's sort of where I figured it out that I really enjoyed the leadership piece and the coaching of people. And I got more excited watching people be successful from my coaching and watching them get promoted than I ever did closing the deal, right? Like I enjoy closing a deal, you know, but it's way more exciting to watch the team do it, right? To see them be so successful, which I assume you've experienced as well with all you. I absolutely love that. And uh, I can connect the dots. So my mentor, and I did the very first podcast in tribute to him, uh, Chet Holmes. So Chet Holmes worked for Charlie Munger, mm -hmm. uh, Warren Buffett's partner. Mm. Chet Holmes took over right. all of the advertisements and, and stuff like that in different publications and stuff like that and went out there and got him. And he actually closed more Fortune 500 companies doing the similar stuff that you were doing starting out. I dedicated the first episode of this podcast that I ever launched to him and his book, The Ultimate Sales Machine, because he's an absolute legend. His methodology for education-based marketing and scaling companies, legendary, right? Doing, getting them in advertorials or whether they were magazines or publications and uh, absolute legend. And if you want to talk about psychology, 
putting it into a methodology, Chet Holmes is the man. That's great. Totally in alignment with how you started your career about all of these different campaigns out there, especially marketing and disruptive marketing and education-based mm -hmm. marketing, where you start right out the, the gate talking about using education-based marketing and the fears to actually entice or influence people to make a decision and use whatever product or service you're going to promote. Nobody better. That's great. Yeah, I'll go check that out. Thank you. So I was just in Japan, right? And I was speaking to 120 business owners. I, I went with a colleague and he was there to speak. And then just right off the bat, you know, I don't know if they thought it was the curriculum or whatever, but then they called me up and, you know, they said, what's your secret to success? You know, because uh, he talked about we have 3,000 guys and he's my partner, right? Patrick Tang, he's a legend. But these Japanese wanted to know, and I said, well, I, I actually use what I call the ultimate success formula. Number one, clarity. Number two is focus. And number three is strategy. But first and foremost, it depends on where you're at in your life because we're all at different stages and phases. Yeah. So Steve Jobs talked about love what you do and you'll never work yes. a day in your life. Yes. Right? Yeah. And uh, I'm talking to these guys that are, they're selling energy, they're selling solar, they're selling water in Japan, and they all have big teams. There's about a thousand of them. There's 120 business owners in the room. And I said, you have to understand where your people are coming from and where are you at right now? Because some have, have five people, five salespeople. And I said, so, you know, when I first started out, you're asking me to the secret to my success is I didn't like what I was doing. I was going door to door selling baggy pants. So for me to tell you I was in love with what I'm doing would be fabricating a bunch of bullshit. Yep. I just went up and I drew on the board a heart uh, and I drew this heart and I said, you know, if you're not in love with what you're doing right now, then you need to fall in love with why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't like going door to door in the snow in Denver, Colorado, and it being, you know, so damn cold all the, a blizzard alert and they closed down all the businesses and to make money we're we're knocking on doors at the apartments and your your hands are so cold you got to pick up a rock because it's so cold but i knew i needed to buy my mom a house she was living in a trailer and i couldn't accept that so i was in love with why but then why did i stay in the businesses so i went on to you know to build direct sales teams all over the world. And they're so, so why did you stay? And I said, because I fell in love with training others. It's like what you're saying, Richard, mm -hmm. you put me in a meeting mm -hmm. room mm -hmm. to work with new salespeople, seasoned salespeople. You know, every time I go in a, a room to train new salespeople, I just go right on the board. Nobody cares. Yes. hundred percent. Because nobody cares about you, your company, your product, your service. Nobody cares. So let's just get that out of the way right now. They only care about what's in it for them. Once you understand that and listen, you'll be great at sales when you're good at service. Yeah. I tell people all the time that nobody cares about your logo salad in your deck. Stop making your logo salad the second slide. Nobody cares. Put it at the end. Show it later. So I, I'm with you 100%. So I love what you do. I love what you do. And when you talk about, you know, all of these scripts, you know, scripts drive you crazy. The reason people are using scripts is because they don't have the right psychology, number one, or two, they don't have a methodology for having a conversation. You want to speak to that? Yeah, I, I, first of all, I don't mind scripts. I like them. I think we all speak in mini scripts all the time, right? If the, someone brings up the competitor, you know exactly what you're saying because you've done it a hundred times off your deck or whatever marketing gave you. What I don't want people to do is sound scripted. There's nothing wrong with the script. I like scripts. They Scripts actually allow you to become better listeners to your point of providing service, but don't sound scripted. Amen. And in doing that, 
find your authentic voice. So how Richard says something's different than John, like I said earlier, right? So I don't mind it. It, it, it bothers me when people tell me they don't like scripts or they hate scripts. And when I get in front of a group, I'll ask who hates scripts. And some of them will be like, what don't you like about it? Well, you know, I, I like calling it a bullet point or I like calling it this, or I don't know. I don't, I, I just don't want to sound robotic. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not what a script is. I'm like, who here loves scripts? And someone always loves them. I'm like, well, why do you like it? It's like, cause I don't have to think as hard. I can actually think about the other person because I already know what to say. I know exactly how to say it. I know what pace and tone, like this is what actors do. This is why they do it and they get paid so well because they, it feels flawless to them, seamless to them. They lose themselves in the character and we believe in who they are in the character, right? And so that's the part I'm trying to get people to understand is don't sound scripted, find your way, right? And a script, by the way, when I talk about a script, 90% of the time, it's exactly the same thing every single time. But there's always 10% that changes, right? Like this, the spiel I just gave you, I guarantee you, if went back and listened to 20 of them, 80% of what I just said is the exact same script. I just don't sound scripted. Yeah, and so to me, that is the methodology. When you stop listening is when it sounds scripted. When you're just reading a script, you're not identifying what is their greatest challenge, what is their biggest problem, Then, and you're just coming from a script rather than coming from a place and space of being r real. And yes, relating 100%. so that you're relevant. That's when if that's when I find people lose the plot. And when and when they sound scripted, they create doubt. And when in doubt, they're out. You know? So you're recognized as a top negotiation voice. Tell me a story when you used your best negotiating strategy strategy. Your best yeah, negotiation um, strategy. Yeah, actually, my hat says uh, negotiation is my cardio. So um, you know, that's sort of my <laughs> workout. But um, I use it all the time. You know, like there, you know, I, I use it. it. It comes up the most often, right? Most oftentimes it comes up for anybody is around price. And we always throw out a price and we always know that they're going to reject it. They're going to ask for a discount. So my strategy is to respond to their request for a discount, no matter what they say, with something that they have to think harder about than me. I, I'm John, you know, look, pricing for my services is $15,379. Well, it's a really weird number because right now they're off their game, right? Now they're like, where did you come up with that number? Holy cow, that's really bizarre. If I say $15,000, guess what? It's a round number. They're going to negotiate. So now I've distracted them for my next question, which is, so John, my pricing is $15,379. By the way, how does that feel? Because pricing is an emotional response. Everything we've ever purchased has an emotional tie to it, right? There's a reason there's all the stuff by the checkout counter at the store, right? There's a reason the candy bars, it's impulse buys. It's an emotional purchase. We've all bought something that was on sale because it was on sale. And then we never wore it. <laughs> we never used it, right? I got so much Amazon crap, I could probably just turn into my own Amazon if I wanted. Um, and so that's the first step of one of my negotiation strategies. Odd, weird numbers, followed by how does that feel? Because nobody knows how to respond to that. Well, they're gonna be like, that feels too high, or, or that feels about right, or that feels too low, right? Well, any of those answers are real answers. If I say it's $15,379, John, is that in your budget? And they're like, well, I don't even remember. As soon as they hear the word budget or price, like they close up. We already know this. And then they're going to say, well, you know, Richard, that, that feels a little high. You know, we were sort of expecting blank. Can you do this? And my response to you then, John, is, hey, John, you know, I appreciate you asking, but my pricing is based on what the market will bear. So the market tells me that this is what the value is. How does this compare to what all other things you've seen? So now all of a sudden I'm having the same conversation we've all been taught to have, but I'm doing it in a different way that makes them have to work and think harder and make them break down, right? Because they can't argue, no CFO can argue, you know, rationally with me that the market doesn't bear that because it's my job to know that it does. 
I know that's what my the market will bear for me. And then finally, if people are going to keep negotiating, it's like, okay, well, John, look, there are three ways we can both leverage commercial terms to our benefit. You can earn a discount by providing marketing support, a multi-year contract, a long uh, prepayment. Each one of those is worth 2%. Which one do you want? So now all of a sudden I've walked them through my entire process and sure, do I have to go to 15 or 20%? Maybe, I don't know, but I just saved myself a ton by saying it's 6% and they got to give me something back. And I used to your point about the psychology of like, there's a way we can both leverage this, not me giving you a discount because you asked for it, but we can leverage this together. So anyways, that's a very long rant. So that's an example of my, negotiation tactic, which is in, which is quote unquote, it's in the book. Got to say it, you know, it's in the book, the seller's journey, blah, blah, blah. But that's how you do it. And it sounds authentic and real. Well, it is authentic and real when you, when you come up with it. Uh, and can you share with us, and you don't have to divulge a company name where that has worked with you in real life. Uh, with Every one of time, every time every client I have, cause they all want a discount. And I use some portions of those, not everybody. Sometimes people will be like, okay, it's, you know, that's what the market will bear. Fair enough. You know, and then I don't have to do the 2%. Uh, General Electric was probably the easiest one to do it with, believe it or not. Like I got sent to procurement. Um, but there's a whole other approach to, well, how do you work with procurement? Cause procurement actually doesn't see you as a negative. They actually don't mind working with salespeople. It's a whole other story, but GE was one, Zoom was one. Um, some other startups that I've done stuff with uh, are one. And, and look, believe me, you know, I would give G, I asked them, I said, look, if you want a discount, I'll give it to you, but I need, I need a quote. I want a quote from General Electric. And they're like, yeah, we can't do that. And they can't, like, there's a whole PR issue. Like they're a big company, right? I got it. I'm like, well, okay. You know, can you prepay? No, we can't do that. <laughs> okay. So, you know, but they knew that I was negotiating in good faith and they knew that what I was doing was respectful to myself and respectful to them. And that's the key piece. Cause I wasn't trying to be a jerk. I wasn't quite as snarky as I might sound here. You know, I'm, there's, there's some empathy in there of like, I understand why you're asking and everybody asks and, you know, everybody wants to negotiate with the sales trainer, right? Like they all want to get over on the sales trainer guy, you know? So, um, so it happens with probably every client because everybody asks for a discount and what we do. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, the fact is people are trained to negotiate to to lower the value <clears throat> to lower the investment so that they get a better ro that's their job and they get a better roi on their the sales training if we get richard to do it for ten thousand dollars no matter what if we get him to do it we save five right off the top and not only that if he increases our sales by a hundred grand or he increases our sales by a million in this division then it's a huge win for us right so it's and really that's by the way that's actually the argument i use i'm like why would you hire me if i actually gave you a five thousand dollar discount if you're wanting me to train your team to not do that what, why well, would you sure. hire that trainer Right. So I, so to your point, they love to do that. And I'm like, by the way, if you've got a team of 10 and you're thinking that, oh, Richard's going to help you close, you know, three deals to pay for it. It's like, no, then you hired the wrong trainer again. I should be helping every one of your reps close five to 10 more deals this year, not three to cover Richard's costs. That's a terrible way to judge, you know, what you're doing. So again, all these little things, like these are all my little mini scripts, by the way, right? Like you can sort of tell that I know it's, you know, they come off very genuinely, at least I hope, but the people, it's so easy to professionally make people just understand that you're not a bad person by saying no to the discount and that they actually want you to say no, because then they actually have more faith in you that you're going to teach their team how to say no. Even with my sales team, I allow them to understand in the absence of value, it's always going to come down to price. And and you know, I love closing deals and I will say a good closed deal is one that 
I walk away from the deal because I close it. Mm -hmm. If you don't see my value, I'm not interested in doing business with you. Yep. And if you're asking me to, to train your team, how confident are you in me to train your team to, to go out there and not only sign deals, but to get the most value for your products and services if I lower my value to you to work with you? Yes. In the absence of value, it's always going to come down to price. And for me, whenever you're offering a product or a service, that should be handled even up front most of the time. Like value seeding and selling the value compared to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Then you become the only obvious choice when you have an irresistible offer. With comparisons, you become the only obvious choice to do business with. You know, I worked with a lady, full disclosure, she sells supplements to farm animals. She does 20 million in sales a year. Jeez. 14 salespeople, $20 million in sales. I worked with her people for seven months and we increased the sales by $5 million. And, and my services were $100,000. And initially she said, well, that's, that's obnoxious. And I said, really? Compared to what? <laughs> exactly. I've never heard that before. And she's like, well, you know, there's local sales trainers that will do it for 10,000. And I said, yeah, you can use them. You can use them. But I know my value. She said, well, can we do it step by step? I said, absolutely. Bottom line is she, we increased her sales by $5 million. She made an additional million bucks and she gave me yeah. a $100,000 service fee. There you go. And she absolutely loves me. I don't do those things very much anymore because I'm running a software company now, right? Right. Tell me right. what's the best advice you've ever received about scaling a sales team? Because you, you actually go in, you do the sales training and you help these companies scale. The best advice I have learned that I've received is that it doesn't matter what you do, whether you're in sales, you're a surgeon, you're an athlete, you're uh, whatever it is you do, the best of the best, the experts are the experts at the details. They're the experts at the minutia, so much so that they don't have to even think about the minutia anymore. And that becomes second nature, right? Like that, that is just who they are. And then it's the next level of skills you build on top of that. So making sure they understand that this is a long process and that this is what makes someone an expert, right? That you can't, rare is the person, I wouldn't say you can't, rare is the person who can read, you know, any sales book over the weekend and all of a sudden become an expert at everything in it. Right? Like it's just not possible. I think the other piece that, that I think, uh, particularly when I work with early stage founders, the mistakes they, they overlook that they don't understand. I have to remind them is that as a founder at a star at a startup, and you're doing the first round of founder led sales, people are buying you the person, right? John, they're buying you as much as they are buying the sales machine right? Because you're the first guy. They know that if something goes wrong, if I try this, I got John's cell phone number. He's the founder. He knows every nook and cranny. He knows every in and out. He knows all the dark alleyways. He knows which place to rent at this time of year and that time of year. He knows those details. And founders so often get frustrated that as they start to scale the team, they forget that that's why they, that's why they were so much more successful in the beginning. And so I think that's one of the biggest challenges. If I, if I understood your question correctly. No, you nailed it. That's one of the biggest piece of advice is that, that I have to remind people of. And it's the same, I have to remind the same thing of to the VP of sales. If they've already got a team of 10, you know, your title is getting you in the door, your CRO title, your VP of sales, you come in with a certain level of authenticity mm -hmm. and experience that is cannot be matched by a sales development rep, SDR, AE, account manager, just based on title alone. And so you have to go back and teach the details that you know, all the way down to the next level, to the frontline people. And if you're an expert at those details, and then you can either yourself or get someone to help you translate that into a way to make it 
your reps and your sales team expert at their roles with the right coaching and training and those kind of things. That's how you scale. I love how you defined it. And the way I define it, it short and simple for me is amateurs wing it. Professionals pre prepare. Professionals prepare. So for me, mm -hmm. you never get a second chance to make a first impression. That came from a commercial. Oh, yeah. From head and shoulders like 20 years ago, right? I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And today you don't even get a first chance to make a first impression because people check you out your products, your services, your social media, your LinkedIn, all these, these things are done before a conversation. So for me, 25% of the sale is made even before you go on a sales call. So what do you know about these people? What are their biggest challenges? What's going on with the marketplace? When you prepare, you are so far ahead of the competition that allows you to have an unfair advantage. Is that what you mean? I, I love what you said. I wrote that down too about amateurs, um, amateurs wing it. Yes, 100% of what you're saying I agree with is that you got to know your audience, right? There's this theory that, oh, the customer, the prospect knows more about you nowadays. I'm like, yeah, well, guess what? You fucking know more about them too, all the way down to a psychology tool. Right. You know, there are all these these other apps that you can use that'll pull up John's psychology and John likes to think this way and you know, put him on a disc profile and put Richard on a disc profile. And so this whole theory that they know more about you is crap, in my opinion, because you should know more about them anyway. Amateurs wing it and that's why they don't win it. If you want to win it, you got to be a professional. Yep. If you want an unfair advantage, you need to prepare. It's, it's interesting, you know. Um, you know, if you if you remember like, okay, let's go create our ideal customer persona profile, right? Okay, our our director of sales is this age and they're this gender and they're this, you know, college educated and they're this and then their VP is this and there's this and there's this. And that's all bullshit. When was the last time someone said, here are 10 people who fit that profile based on their LinkedIn profile? And I'm going to go put them in one of the personality tools. And I'm going to look to see how their personality is motivated. Right. Do they like bullet points or do they like stories? Do they like the? And I'm going to look for commonalities amongst those types of people. And then I'm going to try and build my plan to go after them. And I guarantee you, look, 10 is not going to be enough to tell you how to build your website. Like, I think we all know that. However, I can find the right things to talk about to the right person. And by the way, all this stuff, John, that you and I are talking about, this is what it means to have a good EQ, right? What's our emotional quotient, not our IQ? Like, this is what it takes these days to be prepared, as you said, to come in knowing. So, yeah, I, 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 you got me all fired up on this one, John. Yeah, it's situational. I call it situational intelligence. And, you know, when I was in the direct sales game going door to door in seven countries around the planet, you know, it was all about being a chameleon. Yeah. Yeah. Get in where you fit in, but you know, you got to read the room, you know, like a lot of our, my, a lot of my business is done through LinkedIn and LinkedIn connections and stuff like that. Yeah. Because the first thing about sales is making a connection, right? Like people have lost the fucking art of saying, hi, how you doing, man? Uh, what kind of dog do you have? hundred percent. I got a bully. And a golden retriever. And the golden retriever, the number one best-selling dog on the planet. I'm telling you, this guy, he makes everybody happy. That's awesome. He's mindful. He he pays attention. He listens to mama, right? And he's just absolutely love and just make in love with making people happy every day. People have lost that art of connection. They're so fucking worried about making a sale. They forgot that. The person they're talking to is a real person. Totally agree. Yeah, I call that bringing the humanity back into sales. Come from service, never nervous, man. I learned that lesson in Japan. I got I got attacked while I was on stage by the CEO of Sony. He's like, why should I listen to you? you? You look like one of my average salespeople. And in my mind, I was like, wow, I just bought a Xenia suit. This damn thing cost me 2,000 bucks. I'm, but I'm like, well, you shouldn't. Yep. 
You shouldn't listen to me. If you're not open to learning, absolutely no one in the world is ever going to teach you anything. Yep. And if that's your mindset, then you're not going to get anything out of this. All I can say is I'm here to serve you and actually let you know how I built a team of thousands of people to do sales. Yep. He sat down, the audience stood up and gave me a standing ovation in, in Japan, the most conservative country in the world. That's amazing. And dude, I was so sweating. <laughs> in your $2,000 suit. <laughs> it, it, it was my first time ever speaking publicly outside my own organization about how to build and scale a sales force to millions, yeah. right? And uh, I didn't know anything about the culture. And when I went there initially in 1988 on a submarine, they didn't like us very much. Yeah. We would go into restaurants to eat and they'd be like, nope, no sailors here. Yeah. So that was my experience, but I left that stage saying, wow, Always come from service, never nervous. I never, ever got intimidated again, ever speaking on stage, right? And I always remind myself, because if you come from ego, you're in big fucking trouble. You're in big trouble if you come from ego. Yeah. I've been starstruck. Like I interviewed Al Pacino and I was just like, you know, he's my childhood like hero and shit and he he went he started talking about he was raised by his grandfather and i was raised by my grandfather and i was supposed to ask questions about business but i'm like i was just enamored and i'm like you know what tell me more about that meanwhile i was supposed to be talking about business and self-marketing and stuff like that but that was the last time i mean after that i'm like no more of this starstruck stuff get involved yeah yeah Let's talk about technology and automation because I created the sales machine so that people, companies know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. So we have a patent pending smart framework in there. So there's basically five modules that automate sales, right? And customer service and empowering people with rewards, recognition, competition, compensation, right? So that... Companies can set up goals, KPIs, and empower the salesperson, right? And if you look at our dashboard, you will see rewards, recognition, competition, compensation, leaderboards, task management, of course, deal stages, all of that compared to CRMs. Because I initially looked at CRMs to drive my sales. But then I found out they're just glorified address books and 67% of the people don't use them. I actually bought HubSpot and my people refused to use them. And it was driving me crazy. I'm like, I spent all this money, right? And then I realized because it doesn't empower. You talked about following in love with empowering people to do sales and be as good as you, right? I call that leading from behind. The greatest leaders in the world can empower other leaders, right? So what do you think about technology or CRMs or automation? Yeah, I mean, I, look, it, it's it's necessary and it's helpful, right? Like you and I are, are old enough to remember that, you know, you know, we were using this thing called Lotus Notes. People can go Google it if they want, right? Uh, it was created by IBM before Excel existed. Um, and it was, you know, or gold mine as a CRM, right? Like, you, you know, these places. Um, and the challenge has been that with the best of intentions, so many CRMs have become more like data warehouses as opposed to a machine to what you built at the sales machine, right? So where it can be a little bit more predictive and moving forward as opposed to reactive. And I think the, the CRMs are, are shifting. I think HubSpot's probably been the closest one to get it. Like I, I've worked with HubSpot and Salesforce, so I'm hoping nobody yells at me from either one. Um, you know, I think they're both HubSpot because they started with the small business, you know, as, as, you know, as best I know the story, they were able to build it a little differently than, you know, what the large people did, right? Like, you know, Benioff came from Oracle, right? So he built something big. Um, and the technology's 
becoming so advanced that every department uses it, uh, which is great, and that you can have a central repository. The challenge is, is that, you know, garbage into the machine only produces garbage out of the machine, right? It's like putting diesel in a car that doesn't use diesel gas or vice versa. Uh, you're going to have a big problem. So that's what I like about what you're doing, where you're empowering it at this compensation recognition place. And that's where you're leading, right? Like you're leading from that perspective because you can only do that if you have all the other data anyway. So it's, it's not like you're not having the data, you have it. You know, people ask me, how is the sales machine different than other companies or different than a CRM? I say, first of all, we're not a CRM. We can give you that for free. Mm -hmm. Do we have a CRM in there? Of course. Right. But ultimately, we are a sales performance automation system. We're a complete system so that we can increase your sales, drive performance, and retain your customers, right? You can set and forget. So that's an entirely different thing. So having a CRM is like a tool. Having a CRM with marketing is a power tool. Yeah, no, and I agree with you. I think that, um, I, I think the key piece too is that, you know, it's going to continue to evolve, right? And I think we're finally at that cusp with, you know, the, the challenge we have now isn't the AI. The challenge is how do we not let the AI just continue to accelerate the suck like so many other sales things we've had, right? Like if, you know, everybody's still, pr you know, spraying and praying and all that kind of stuff. I'm not convinced that people aren't going to try to do the same thing with AI. I think they're going to just try and do it. So they're just going to keep accelerating the suck. How do you accelerate the suck with AI? Because, you know, if you lose the connection to people, mm -hmm. then you've lost the plot. And I think you can get there, right? Like, I think you can have the AI reach out to John based on John's personality in a way that matters based on the conversations that you've had, based on what you know about them, based on, you know, you know, if you've had a couple of sales conversations um, and or if you know who the people who are on John's buying committee, right? Because it's all done by a committee so that I could, you know, I could have the tool be able to say, hey, John, if your, you know, CTO thinks this way, here's something you might like to share with them. If they think this way, you might like this. Let us know which one it is because we can keep giving you more wheel, you know, more, more ammunition for you. So the AI is there. I just think everybody's going to just like everything else, we're going to, you know, accelerate too fast to it. Yeah. So what we've done in the sales machine, and uh, it's actually happening this week, Richard, I'm in alignment with you and I have no interest in accelerating the suck mm -hmm. in sales, right? I'm all mm -hmm. about first and foremost, build a connection, not matching and mirroring and, you know, talking about all this rapport, mm -hmm. build a connection, man, find out about the people. What do they love to do and how do they do it? Right? So we're incorporating AI to be your co-pilot. Mm -hmm. You need to build a connection. You need to talk to people. And we just use the AI to empower you with a co-pilot so if you need a battle card, if you need industry uh, specifics and marketplace information to empower your clients and customers, then we use AI as a co-pilot so that you can serve better, faster, more efficiently. And it saves the salesperson time so that they have more time to build that connection, to come from service, to solve problems, and make sure they're satisfied. There you go. What an honor to have you on, Richard. The seller's journey is real. And if you want to be relatable, if you want to be real and be relevant right now, you got to go pick up the book because it will guide you uh, with fundamentals that are timeless uh, through story and allow your company or the salespeople at your company to make more sales sooner rather than later by Richard Harris. Richard, what's next for you? I don't know. I've been thinking about doing another book. Uh, this one was such a massive process though that I don't know uh, around sales management and leadership because you know as well as I do, none of us got a, any sort of human relation skills <laughs> in terms of managing humans. We all got promoted for lots of other reasons, none of which were 
oh, you know how to manage a human at this level emotionally. Uh, so I've been thinking about writing that book to give some of those skills and, and the skills actually align with sales in general, right? Like the same discovery skills and the same thing. They're just different contexts. So that's sort of the next thing to others, uh, just continuing to grow the business, right? Where if you're looking for sales training and uh, go to market strategies, if you're an early stage founder and you need that part of your business handled, or if you've got a sales team and you want to up the game, um, teach them how to earn the right to ask questions, which questions to ask and when that's, that's my bread and butter. Right on, man. And you know, you can, you can make great French toast with that bread and butter. Just grab some syrup because you got the secret sauce. Um, I love it. And they can find you on LinkedIn, Richard Harris. Yep. Where else can they find you to do this, business with you? Yeah, this is the cool, this is, this is the part nobody ever believes. Everybody grab a pen or a pencil. 415-596-9149, 415-596-9149. Yes, that's my real cell phone number. It's the same one. My teenage sons text me when they need something or my wife needs to remind me to do something that I forgot that she told me 12 times. Uh, so that's my real phone number. Uh, text me ahead of time just to let me know you heard us on the sales machine, so I'll know to pick up. But um, you can get a hold of me there. You can find me on LinkedIn and it's the harrisconsultinggroup.com or thesellersjourney.co. You can find the book at thesellersjourney.co. Amen, brother. Cut from the same cloth. Love it. Have a great day. You too, man. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. That's a wrap, folks. Thanks for joining me today. And if you got value from this episode, do me a favor, like, subscribe, and refer a friend. And if you want even more value, go to thesalesmachine.com Click on resources and there's tons of resources there to increase profits and drive performance in your business. Right on, right on, come on.